Hello everyone, this is Andre and this is my very first podcast. Surprise, surprise. Um, I should probably start explaining why I decided to do podcast, even though uh, based on my first educational video that I posted on Wednesday, I'm probably not very good at explaining things. But I'll try my best. So there are a couple of reasons. Number one reason is that I want to practice uh, just speaking in general. Uh, I mean, without preparation, you know, just try to uh, explain my thoughts in the best way that I can. And the reason for that is that I want to be producing a lot more content, but like I was trying to focus too much like on on the quality and I think like I wasn't very efficient in the process. So I think I'd rather like, instead of like aiming for like 100% quality, I'd rather just do like 80% with the 20% effort, you know, the 80-20 rule. So I'm actually going to try to do this whole thing in one go. So you should be prepared to hear a lot of pauses, a lot of thinking, a lot of ums, a lot of breathing here and there. And um, yeah, so that that was the first part, like I want to practice just speaking. The second thing is podcast, I think is a good medium for me uh, because I can just speak and try to voice my opinions in a way that uh, that is kind of representative of me and you will find out eventually like as you listen to this uh, podcast and maybe like even if you like work with me in the past you know that I'm not very I cannot like explain my thoughts in a concise way because usually like my mind travels all around the places and I think about like million things. Um, So I think like when I'm producing content for YouTube, I think I'm trying to uh, make the message more um, efficient just, you know, get straight to the point and think of the right words uh, so that the video is like not like one hour long and it gets to the point and it's like dynamic and it tries to, you know, retain your attention. But for audio, I think I'm just going to, you know, talk. <laughs> I'm just going to talk uh, in my own way, you know, and yeah, so I think that hopefully that once I get better at this, uh, the thoughts will come out easier. And mm, well, I'm getting getting sidetracked again. So what I was trying to say is that I think that like audio is like a better format like for me to speak like for a longer time without trying to be completely concise and efficient in my uh, messaging or like what I'm trying to explain. The third, the third reason is that as I was explaining in one of the previous videos, mm, doing a podcast to me is like the second pillar content that I want to be doing as part of my content strategy, which is pretty much based on Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, content model or content strategy. So and in that video, I was explaining that my priority will be educational content on YouTube. So that's uh, videos. And the second thing that I want to do is podcast. So Gary and that would be Yeah, this is good. No, yeah, (laughs) I'm still like within the third reason. And that is that um, Gary Vee is like very high, very big on podcasts, because with like Alexa and with all the 
uh, voice recognition, he's saying that that's the future and it kind of makes sense because um, because it will save us time if we can just speak and just aura things just by saying something. Um, and also people are consuming more uh, audio content like podcasts because you can consume it pas passively like you don't have to read anything like when you commute or when you drive you can do it um, so that's why I that's the third reason why I decided to do podcasts and the fourth reason which kind of um, is aligned with number three is that I don't think there is actually any podcast which is dedicated to localization. I only heard one or two episodes. I'm not sure if, even if they have like episodic podcast, the guys from Common Sense Advisory. So the last one that I heard was um, with the lady from Netflix. I forgot what her position was, but uh, when I was actually applying for a job with Netflix, I was doing research like on her role and stuff like that. And I found the podcast that, uh, no, 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 sorry. It's not Common Sense Advisory. It's actually, I think it was Moravia. Uh, was it, uh, what's his name? Benito something or Benanito? I think he's like a CMO or someone. Uh, whatever, so he was like, interviewing her so but hmm, how to explain this in the right way so that podcast is like a typically you know like a professional podcast like hey what what were you doing and stuff like this so what I want to be doing and because I want to do this on a regular basis is that I thought that like the easiest way for me to do something localization related and because I cannot speak about my work, what I do is that I thought that I was just, I would just um, go over some localization news. So I just go to Google, I type in localization news and I found like three websites where I could look at all the articles that were published in the last week, I can go through them, try to read a few things here and there. And mostly I can, I mean, I can, I will provide like my own commentary on what's happening. I'm not sure if I can do it for every topic. But I mean, that's that's how I want to start. I hope that it's not going to like violate like some, uh, some copyright issues because I don't want to pro I probably don't want to like read like the whole article, which was published by someone else, uh, word by word. But I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, we'll see, we'll see in a while, because that is what this first episode will be about. So that's the first thing that I thought because I can do this on a regular basis. The second thing, ugh, I need to change. Oh, fuck, I forgot to make a marker to remove the stupid noise when I'm changing position on my chair. Ugh, okay. So the second part which I want to be covering and which again is something that I can do on a regular basis is going through social media and seeing like what's new, what's trending for localization. And this is one of the reasons why I started to be more involved in the communities like on LinkedIn, I look at Facebook, Reddit, some of them are like pretty dead. So I think that LinkedIn groups will be uh, the biggest source of some news that I could be covering. But I definitely want to be like the guy who kind of like brings in like the new trends to you in audio way. Uh, so that you can like catch up with like what's happening on social media, because I think that and this is just like my personal opinion. I think that like localization is usually always fucking far behind the trends. So yeah, I want to be the guy to bring you the news in my own special way with my specific, very casual uh, 
perspective. And is there another reason? Yeah, so so this this will be like the content then that I can provide on my own on a weekly basis. We'll see if I need to do it on a weekly basis, or if there will be too many articles, then I will need to do it uh, twice a week. And the third part that I wanted to do is definitely because it's a podcast and in podcasts, usually you have um, interviews with people. So of course, that would be people from the from our industry. Uh, but I want to take a specific spin on that. And I just want to talk about like localization and best practices and blah, blah, blah. But um, especially like after landmark and like after all the talks that I have like with my colleagues, like how people are like, I don't know, different uh, at work and how they become more real, like when they're in like a casual environment, and especially if they like drink, that's like when you get like who the people really are. So to me, that would be the third thing that I would like to have in this podcast. And probably if I get to that point, and I actually interview people, that will be just one episode about that. So I will not be mixing the uh, localization news and social media coverage in those podcasts. So yeah, I want to have some people here from the industry and like really talk to them like about like who they are, how they grew up and stuff like that and how they do localization and blah, blah, blah. And to take that even further, and I already mentioned this, that people become more real when they drink. And this is an idea that I had a long, long time based on my experience with one lady, <laughs> with one manager from Autodesk, uh, who was like very smart. She was like uh, very important in the localization department. And of course, she was like very, very, very professional. But like when I was like sitting with her outside, I think it was, I don't know, I don't, I forgot like what's the name of the Singapore uh, river. We were sitting just there casually and just drinking, you know, and it's like at these moments when like people tell you the things that they really think and especially like if they use the words like, please don't tell this to anyone. It's like, that's like the best part, you know, because like they reveal their true self to you. So, um, going back to the idea, the idea was that I wanted to have like some uh, podcast or like interview, or maybe it should be just like a video where we actually just drink during the whole process. We or like with the goal of, you know, getting drunk so that like the interview is like, gets like really real. And it will be probably even more entertaining. But that's like for the future. So I think it's uh, 15 minutes. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty long intro, I guess. Um, but yeah, but I guess you will need to get used to it because this is, this is how how my mind works. So with that being said, I'm going to put a marker here. So right around before 15 minutes. I'm going to Google and I'm typing in localization news. All right. And here we have two main things that come up. Number one, actually, number one is localization news at Twitter. Um, but that's not for me, I guess. So number one is Slater. And I never heard about this site before. So and I checked the site and I think they do a pretty good job. And that is something that actually our industry was missing for quite some time, like somebody who would be covering stuff like this. So so technically, I'm <laughs> competing uh, against later with audio. I'm not sure if they do any podcast, probably no. But they cover like the what they say, Slater language industry intelligence. Okay, I don't know what that means, but whatever. Um, so yeah, we'll see, we'll see what what it says, maybe it will be like too high level for me, just by looking at the latest articles. But we'll see the second thing that comes 
up in the results is multilingual news. <clears throat> so that should be not a surprise for everyone. I know that when I started in Moravia a long time ago, I think it's like 14 years ago, I was 19. Now I'm, I'll be 34 in August. So I think it's around holy shit, it's like 15 years. Um, yeah, I think I at that time, we were still getting like the subscription to their magazine. And I think I Yeah, the, they still do the magazines. I see the magazines at global me. So they survived, say so they survived for quite a long time. Uh, the third thing that I see here is E content mag, uh, state of translation and localization. That doesn't seem interesting. That seems like like one time article. And the fourth thing that I he see here is from Gala. And yeah, so I was actually when I was thinking about the podcast and what I could do, I actually check these website. So I did this Google search, you know, for localization news before. And so I kind of try to map like uh, what I could be using. So I did open gala news. Although when I looked at it last time, it was really just like, like an aggregator of let me drink. It was just like an aggregator of press releases. So I think there won't be anything useful there. Uh, where am I 20 minutes? Okay, so with that being said, let me let me change my position. And let's start with Slater. So here's the thing. I went through all Slater articles, then I stopped the recording in Slater. Uh, <laughs> I went through all articles in Slater, and then I stopped recording in Premiere. And then I saw the sound waves at some point, they just kind of like vanished. They were like very quiet. I have no idea what happened if it's like a software issue of the or, or if there was something with the microphone, but pretty much everything I did in that one hour is lost because I don't know if I can recover it because the sound quality is just so bad and there are like some glitches here and there. So I think I will have to go through the articles again, <laughs> unfortunately. But there's one thing that I kind of re realized while I was doing this. <clears throat> so it's later, there are a couple, like a lot of the articles are like, really business oriented, like m a like somebody acquired someone, somebody's revenue fell down. So I think like for the next podcast, and this is like, you know, I just wanted to jump into this and just see what comes comes out of it. So I think like for the next podcast, I will need to probably do some preparation and maybe I'll just go through the articles before I start recording. And I'll just give you like a quick rundown of the articles that I think like only like, are like business related. And I just try to distill the information for you. Especially if I cannot provide like any useful commentary for it. <clears throat> and for the ones where I can not provide commentary, I'll just you know, talk, 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 and talk. So let's, uh, I'll try to quickly go through these articles, because actually, now I remember what they were about. So the first article in this week, and that is from July first is media localizer zoo digital strives to move past frustrating disruptions. And basically, this whole article was about zoo digital, which is like a media localizer. And it was reported that their revenue went down. And so did their operating profit, they had operating loss of 11 million USD 2018. 
Um, and then there was a chart. Yeah, there's a chart of their share price, which was at 160 pounds per price uh, per share in August 18. And now in July 19, it's only 80 pounds. So they dropped by 50%. And I think the comment that I provided for this article was like, regarding media, it's kind of related to the, like me starting YouTube, you know, like video content is like so big these days. And so will be audio. Um, hmm. Because like, it's like, it's like a passive consumption of the content which actually then brings me back to the fact that if you just look like subtitles, it's not passive content, like full passive content, because you have to actually read the subtitles. So if mm, but then you probably also want to watch the video anyway, so I guess it's fine. But yeah, my, like my point is like the like for marketing, like video content is definitely probably something that's not going to go down. So I'm wondering why these guys are reporting a decline in their revenue. Although I think it was mentioned in the article that they were like trying to do like many things. Um, Anyway, I'm wondering like how audio localization will change with with Alexa and stuff like that coming into play. Anyway, the second article from July two was about the Slater job index being up again. And this is something where I, I didn't understand much like what the uh, what the job index is about. And it's like only my assumption is that it kind of like tracks like how many um, job postings there are like across various platforms like LinkedIn and stuff like that. So I guess it means that there are still more and more jobs being available in our industry. Third article was about Indian government to invest 65 million USDs in translation for SciTech students. And let me open the article. And I think it was basically about the government sponsoring the translation of educational material and also creation of um, new material in uh, Indian languages. I mean, it wasn't that interesting. And this is the this is the this is the, the next article from July four is the one where I provided most of the commentary. So I'm going to get into it once again. And it's about creator of Trados joins Sumalingue board says cat tools will become obsolete. Suma Lingue Technologies appointed Jochen Hummel executive supervisory board member on June 28, 2019. Hummel told Slater he will advise and guide the company on sales strategy, technology implementation, and developing business relationships, among other matters. A company wide memo provided Slater further stated that Hummel will be active in the life of our company by meeting us and our customers on a regular basis. So first of all, I was saying that Suma, these guys like the CEO and CSO, I don't know what that means, probably like a chief strategist, strategic officer. <laughs> they were actually in our offices one or two weeks ago. And our recent experience with them is kind of kind of questionable to put it in the right way. And what I discovered in this article as I was reading it, so let me 
uh, say to you, based in Krakow, Poland, Suma Lingua is listed on the Warsaw Stock Exchange, trading under the ticker blah blah blah. The company's market capitalization currently stands at over 20 million USD, although shares are traded thinly. The company merged with Indian language service provider Mayflower in late 2017 and acquired Sweden's Communicera in late 2018. So I was actually surprised that first of all, their public company and second that their capitalization is 20 million USDs. Like, I don't know, like, and that's like based on our experience, like, I would never think that their capitalization would be that big. Hmm. Yeah, well, I won't comment any further <laughs> on that. But let's get back to the main point what this guy said, and that is about cat tools becoming obsolete. So here it is, according to Hummel, the cat tool will soon disappear as neural machine translation NMT becomes the center of the workflow, as opposed to translators using cat tools, humans will thus work thus work around NMT as it translates. We are doing it already now, he said. Also, there are tons of research and engineering resources thrown at NMT. It will progress fast. Of course, NMT quality also depends on language pairs and available high quality data. So how soon before the cat tool completely goes away? I'm sure we are only talking about a few years. Hamo said, adding that what has delayed full disruption is the fact that sunsetting cat also disrupts the current biz models of LSPs. Instead of selling words and throwing them over the wall with a nice gross margin, well, I'm not sure if it's that nice, they have to up their game and learn how to manage multilingual data. As for the professional translator, Hummel believes their work will evolve in that of a subject matter expert. He said that although NMT has reached human parity or will soon, this doesn't necessarily mean that the quality will be great, but as good or as bad as what you get with today's budgets, time constraints and training, he explained. Human parity changes everything because doing words is done by a machine. However, for several use cases, revision by subject matter experts is required. Many professional translators are experts in their field. Others will create multilingual knowledge, curate linguistic assets, or engineer translation workflows, Hummel said. This is where I want to say my opinion, which I did before, but it got fucked by the by the recording software. I think it was software because Audacity is recording pretty well so far. And so the question is, with NMT, if the quality gets better, and it would be equal to human translation, how will the role of translators change? So this guy says that they will evolve into that of a subject matter expert. And what the word subject matter expert meant in Autodesk is that is someone who actually is like a power user or has like a deep knowledge of the industry and that product and kind of uses it. So it's very different from a translator, let's say translator having 10 years of experience translating IT, you know, because usually, at least in my experience, the translators, they say like, okay, I specialize in like IT or medical translations, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't make them subject matter experts on let's say, processors or or I don't know, give me one like Autodesk product, as an example, like, uh, <laughs> like AutoCAD, like they don't use AutoCAD, like on a daily basis, they're not not subject matter experts. Actually, 
in Ardennes, the subject matter experts were not linguists at all. Because you are not subject matter expert if you are a linguist or a translator. That makes you subject matter expert in the field of translation, but you are not subject matter experts in the field of what you're translating. If that makes sense. So can they can the translators shift into subject matter experts? I don't think so. And let's say that the the quality of the NMT output is the same as uh, the one of like a normal translator. Would you then rather have it post edited by uh, by one person who is still not like subject matter expert? Or would you rather have the NMTP output reviewed by a crowd of actual subject matter experts? And if we go back to like the, let's say IT processors, like people who, I don't know, manufacture processors or design processors or they sell processors, they are subject matter experts. It's not the translator that's subject matter expert, in my opinion. So what would be more beneficial? Who is more, uh, more design, I mean, who is more, not design, what would be the right word? Who is more per, 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 <laughs> Who is more? I mean, who who fits the role of subject matter expert more? Is it the translator who has, I don't know, whatever, 10, 20 years of experience in localization in translating IT content, or if it's the people who actually use the tool or the product on a daily basis, and they also speak the target language? Of course, it's going to be the second second option, right? <laughs> so that's my point of on the, the, the NMTs. And here's another interesting question. Let's say that we start with you as a customer or you as LSP start with start using an NMT. And I don't know how it actually works. Um, but I assume it's kind of like it gets better over time. So let's say that you start doing MTPE, right? You generate uh, the translation from NMT and then you send it to the to the editor for post editing. And let's imagine that you are that editor, which if we assume that NMTP, NM, NMT is going to replace the translators, then all the translators will have to shift to editors. So let's say that you're the translator editor who's doing the post editing. You get the first batch and you see that it's shit. So you fix it. But then over time, it gets better. Until one day you get the quality of until one day you get a quality of NMT that's like very good. And you don't have much to change, what are you going to do? Because any customer, or any LSP that actually uses data to drive their solutions, and to optimize their processes and budget, they're going to notice that you are doing less and less edits. So at some point, they're going to ask the question like, why do we need to send this to the editor if the quality is already that good. And so technically, you by providing the edits, you are making <laughs> the machine better, which in the end, means you're killing your own job and your customer because at some point you're probably going to become obsolete. 
so so that is my perspective like like if the NMT actually reaches the quality of human translators then what will be their role they are not subject matter experts so what does he say what else could they be they will create multilingual knowledge i have no idea what that means does it mean like creating content from scratch in the own language like hmm multilingual knowledge like what is it like being like a consultant or something i don't know what it means curate linguistic assets is it kind of like a qa that would make sense but we already have like QA testers and QA testers are probably cheaper than the translators and editors because they just um, they just look at the uh, localized assets from a perspective of user right they're not required to look at the terminology I mean unless you ask them to do it um, they're not supposed to provide like the linguistic quality right they're supposed to check like other things like are the assets correct like are there like any overlay i mean blah, 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 how do how do we call it overlaps and stuff like that you know like functional functional testing and stuff like that or engineer translation workflow so this is the last thing that Hummel says that the translators should shift to but this is like bullshit like how would the translator shift into engineering translation workflows? Like translators usually don't, and I may be wrong here, but they usually don't view the whole workflow, um, I mean, from start to end, right? Because they're just like part of the workflow. I mean, an engineering translation workflows like you would probably set up the workflow at once. Like how would you engineer it like on an ongoing basis? Like how can that become like a full-time job like to engineer translation workflows, especially by translators? Like that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. So then what will the translators actually do? I have no idea. I have no idea. What do you think? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, so that was the article that kind of uh, stuck with me. And then there were two more. One of them was... Uh, two more. The first one was Accolade by live words as it accelerates up the language industry food chain. So this was another M&A article. And I have not much to say about that. And the last one was SDL gearing up for general release of AI pack SDL language cloud. And this is again where I can provide some some information. <clears throat> so the article says it's from July 5, 2019. Despite the abundance of tools in the market, translation productivity cat remains an unsolved problem. There are still gains to be made and the market remains fairly fragmented. A recent report from a number of EU institutions identified gaps in existing productivity tools in terms of user friendliness and interoperability and stated that the future smart cat environment is yet to be yet to be developed. Oh, now I see why it's here. It's a sponsored content. Okay, I'm going to fuck you up as the Indeed, the era of continuous localization and the, and the advent of artificial intelligence have brought about fresh challenges and opportunities in the field of translation productivity. On the sidelines of a recent customer event in London organized by SDL, developer of productivity tool Tratos Slater spoke to SDL CEO Adolfo Hernandez. Ooh. The event featured a preview of their new translation management system, TMS, SDL Language Cloud, which is set to go live in September 2019. A number of language cloud modules include translation memory, 
terminology management, automated workflow, NMT, and a content analyzer. Hernandez pointed out how the dial of adoption is moving as NMT usage in the language industry becomes widespread across LSPs and end users alike. In fact, according to the aforementioned EU report, NMT has become an integral part integra, 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 integra part of a linguist toolbox and most EU translation services provide NMT output to their linguists. Uh, beyond machine translation, there is potential for broader AI to be applied to other facets of language production. Hernandez shared his view on NLP, saying there's a lot more to natural language processing than translation. As the uh, language cloud's content analyzer is a foray into this wider application of AI, the content analyzer uses AI to identify the subject matter of the source content through, sorry, my camera messed up, through uh, where we are, through tagging. This has the potential down the line to help automate project allocation by, say, matching a subject matter to suitable freelance translation resources. SDL Language Cloud is the first solution to use ML. I have no idea what ML means to understand content before con before it is handled for translation. Continuous localization. So I mean, the content analyzer, the way I understand is, is that like, you feed content into the cloud, and somehow it analyzes what the content is about. And based on that, it can say like, okay, this is like IT, this is HR, this is I don't know, marketing content and stuff like that. Is it that useful? I mean, like, can't you just tag it somehow or say like from this CMS only documentation goes to the cloud and from this one, it's, uh, I don't know, marketing or something like that. Okay, let's continue. Continuous localization. Slater also spoke to Andrew Thomas at the same event. Thomas is Senior Director of Marketing at SDL. He said what makes SDL Language Cloud different is that it's being designed specifically for continuous localization. Continuous localization requires on-demand localization at scale, and Thomas said that's a scale that nobody has really tackled yet because the infra infrastructure wasn't there. I mean, really? Oh. What? As the name suggests, SDL Language Cloud is a cloud-based solution. It is designed for companies to manage their end-to-end -end localization process and combines machine intelligence with integration into SDL Trata Studio, among others. SDL Language Cloud is based on the microservices architecture, so like Netflix, meaning that customers can choose to switch available modules on and off as required. Customers can also request human translation services from SDL through language cloud. Thomas explained that a number of SDL's other tools were developed for different use cases and different niche types, meaning they are primarily geared toward serving a number of specific customer needs. Arguably, WordSower is predominantly focused on large enterprises with large complex issues, multi-trends, was really designed for the regulated industry with security in mind. Group share was designed for the LSPs because it was cost effective and aligned with Trotto CSET. But SDL Language Cloud is targeted at a broad customer base, including enterprise clients, third party LSPs, and translators. The shorthand vision is all, 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 all content types, all translation methods, all users involved in the process. That is the goal. Thomas said, adding, initially we're going to be focused on new customers and we're probably going to be focused squarely on localization departments within the enterprise. Makes sense. Uh, so this is where I wanted to pause. And I know, and I know this is going to sound odd, but this is kind of a thing that I was trying to work on. <coughs> Sorry. When I was 
working on my startup a couple of years ago. And I'm really surprised that like, there is no integrated solution like this already in the market. And they're saying that it's going to be only now like their solution is the first that that integrates everything. And it's only going to be released in September 2019. So what I was working on was kind of similar. And I know that Lionbridge had something like that, like Lionbridge, I think it was on demand. So basically, you log in, you can upload your content, and then you can choose whether you can kind of like build up like your own workflows. And one of them would be like, okay, I upload content, it goes through MT, then somebody does the PE, and then I get the translation in the end, or I can choose like a human translation, I can choose editor, I can choose two editors, whatever you want, like how many review steps you want, and then I get the translation in the end. So that's kind of like a simplified version of what I see now. But the way I understand it is like this is going to be integrating everything. So you connect API, you connect it to all your content management systems, the content goes into the language cloud, it gets analyzed, I don't, I was already explaining this, like, I don't know why it needs to be analyzed. Can't you just say like, this is like, from this API, I don't know, only this type of content goes into the cloud. <clears throat> then you can probably set up the set up the da, 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 set up the um, the workflows, which you would probably do um, at the beginning, like during like your setup or configuration stage. And then it gets NMT, then it get post edited. And I don't know what happens then, like if they can do also like in context review, or not. But here, where where was this thing? Uh, it's the last paragraph. So according to Hernandez, there are a lot of good people out there doing cloud TMSs. Yes, there are a lot of people who've got productivity tools and workbenches. There are a lot of people who got neural solutions, there are some people who have project management and workflow management, but I haven't seen anyone who's got all of this integrated in the same place as we have. But how is it? this is like not revolutionary or anything like that. Like you can have cloud teams. Okay, that's like a standard. That's a standard thing. That's not very difficult. Although I mean, cloud words doesn't even do that. But okay. We got productivity tools, which I understand it's kind of like a cat. That's how this whole Slater portal refers to cat tools and workbenches. Like, okay, so you can edit online. Fine, that's not something new. There are a lot of people who've got neural solutions. Fine, you just you just add like an extra step in your workflow, which sends the content to your NMT engine. Fine, that's that's nothing amazing. There are some people who have project management and workflow management. So okay, I mean, you can have like some nice overview of where each stage is and how long it should take and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a better interface to to TMS. So you can see all the steps laid out in like a better project management overview. And that's pretty much it. So they're just integrating this. So I don't know if this is like such a huge thing. To me, it's not because it's still like still sits within SDL, you know, it's like, if you're using different platforms, then you are probably fucked because you need to use their solution. So ideally, like it should be like very modular kind of like plugins, like you can set up like, a, hmm, no. I mean, like you should have the ability to change like which NMT engine. I mean, I don't know, I don't know much about NMT, but if there are like different engines, like you should be able to pick anyone, any, 
I hope that SDO won't be like forcing one NMT to be used. Uh, what else is there? Like API that's not new, like TMS in cloud and Workbench in cloud, like that's old school thing. And then you just put in like some nice project management and workflow management, which is also not that super great. I mean, let's see. And actually this kind of like brings me back to the thing that I was saying in the beginning, like localization always is so fucking behind the trends. Like how is it, why is this only coming like in 2019? Like what the hell? Oh, what the hell? Anyway, um, I think I should like keep an eye on this. I'm pretty sure there will be like another well, it's in September, right? So that's one, two, that's in two months. And what else can I say about this one? Hmm. I don't know. I will keep an eye on this and see uh, how it works out, but to me, it's just like catching up with, with the trends. I'm pretty sure that it's like, like if you think about it, just, I don't know. It's like connecting all the pieces into like one package. I don't know. I'm, I'm not that sold on this. I mean, if no, like, here's the thing, like, like the idea is like pretty good. Like everything should be integrated into one solution. That's no doubt. The question is like, why is it only coming now? And why is it coming by SDL? Like, was there really nobody else like doing something like this? Because this is actually like a sponsored content. So I'm not sure what the other solutions are there. But yeah, anyway, okay. So that covers Slater. Finally, I'm done. And finally, let's have a look at something new that I haven't done before. And now I have to re record. So uh, 40 minutes, I'm heading to multilingual news. And let's see what is new there. Oh, my God, what is this page? This is like just like a list of titles. Oh, no. What the hell? Okay, I'm going to the home page because I thought that like multilingual had like a better news. Please tell me that the home page. Oh no, what the fuck? No. Okay, now I understand why Slater is on top because they actually provide like news. And this is like uh opportunity for me actually <laughs> because yeah like the coverage of news in the localization industry sucks the multilingual i cannot show you just go to multilingual.com and like their home like the news they say they say it, like they have no pictures there's no like i don't know like meta description or something like that it's just like a title and all these titles actually look like press releases, which is something that Gala has too. So they don't put much effort into that. And there's only one news uh, from July 3rd, and that is Transperfect achieves ISO blah, 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 18587 certification. And what is there? <laughs> it's just like what, like two sentences. Transperfect, a provider of global business services, has achieved certification to the ISO eighteen five eight seven standard. The standard provides universal requirements to ensure the quality of translation produced using artificial intelligence tools, including machine translation and NMT. And Okay, how is this news? Holy shit. How is this news, man? This is such a terrible thing. Okay, it looks like they 
they're still stuck in the old world because why don't you produce like more articles uh why don't you produce more articles other than the one that you do for your magazine man please guys you need to switch to modern era it's the 21st century like i see there are articles on their home page but i saw these articles actually in the magazine and there are some insights what are insights multilingual insights and the last one is from june 9 and today is july 6th what is going on i'm disappointed i'm disappointed yeah the last one is from june 9 then the one before is from may 10 the one before is april 23. Ooh. do they only produce content every month and what are insights there, here's the description insights cover language sorry insights covers language through multilinguality and translation localization and global markets individual skills and emerging technologies enablers and barriers knowledge and speculation what what the fuck does that mean oh my god this is bad this is very disappointing and transperfect achieves iso certification like what the fuck i don't know why like why so many companies are uh so much like showing off and going for the iso certifications i have no idea do the customers really care about iso certifications maybe i'm just not experienced in this but i don't know to me it's the same as with pmp it's like bullshit pmp doesn't make you a good pm <laughs> okay so this is disappointing but it's good because I can get to P soon. Because, okay, I'm moving to Gala, which is the last one. And the news here are the same shit as multilingual. Because they're just fucking press releases. So there are four press, release, press releases in July. And let's have a look. Number one, from July 1st. Janus Worldwide participated in LSP Leadership Council hosted by CSA in Boston. Okay, so what? Oh. The shift toward digital globalization means that companies can reach international markets with less capital-intensive business models and manage their worldwide operations in leaner, more efficient ways. Yeah. What opportunities and risks does the era of digitalization present for the LSP industry today? Trends, strategies, and market analytics were discussed by LSP industry experts at a recent event in Boston. For almost two decades now, CSA research has been valued by language service providers for its commitment to the high standards of primary market research, gathering, managing, and analyzing language service market trends and data. The LSP Leadership Council, an event regularly hosted by CSA, was this year held in Boston on May 29 to 30. The council brought together CEOs and executives from the leading global language service providers giving them an opportunity to network and share their vision for the translation industry's prospects. President and CEO of Janus Worldwide, Mr. Konstantin Yoseliani, attended the discussion panel and shared his view of the future of localization industry. Oh my god, what the fuck? How can you how can you press release something like this? Like where is that view? Just share that and not that you attend it a conference and you say that you shared a view of the future of the localization industry okay i would rather learn like what that view is instead of just hearing that you shared a view like why don't you share it publicly like just do it on your social media or whatever please 21st century okay next one 
Queen's Word winner Language Insight becomes ISO. Oh, please. Why do I have to keep reading about these ISO stupid things? Okay, moving on. Across systems, streamlines terminology work with cross term now. With the latest update of its across language server, across systems, GMBH has also supplemented its additional component cross term now with new functions. Now the web based terminology solution allows the mapping of individual workflows and assignment of workflow steps to individual users. Um, okay, and there's a free webinar. Okay, not interested. Accolade acquires live words. And this is something that we read about on Slater. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I will not be going through this, man. I will not be going through this. So, okay, I think I will end the recording very soon. So we covered, we looked at three major portals, that is Slater, Multilingual and Gala. And multilingual and gala, that's just very disappointing, because that's actually not covering what's happening in the localization. So it's definitely only Slater that seems to be like the most relevant sorts of information. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the disappointing thing is that they are mainly focused on like, like really like business, you know, like revenues. Uh, m and and stuff like that. It's not about like, going deep into the like day to day work. So maybe that is something that I should be doing. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll start my own media company and will report on how how to translate word documents and stuff like that. <clears throat> no, but seriously, um, yeah, I think it's it's a it's a, it's a good start. I'm very happy that I did this first part. And like I was saying before, I will need to probably do more preparation for the next part, so that I don't read the the articles. And maybe I just go through the articles for the past week, I select the paragraphs, which I want to read to you so that you have a context. And so that I don't have to rephrase the articles because that's where I will be will probably uh, make you suffer a little bit because I will need to find the right words and I might miss some important context. And I will pick the articles where I can actually provide some commentary. So I think that seems like a good strategy. And I think this could be really valuable to some people, you know, just to read the news. And yeah, and because it took me this much time, I'm definitely not going to do to to cover the social social media for localization. So I think for that, I will use episode number two. So please stay tuned. That was it from me for the first one. And also just FYI, if by any chance you're still listening to this, which you're most likely not. <laughs> Um, what I will do is that I will also probably and I didn't want to do this because I didn't want to spend that much time in like post editing. But I feel like some of the things that I said that I said in the towards the end, like like the critic critique of multilingual and gala, maybe I should just, you know, grow some balls and just extract that part and just tag them like on social media and see how they react because to me like definitely like they really seem like I don't I have no doubt like why Slater is number one because they actually do like coverage of language I mean uh, localization news the other ones they are just like you know like publishing press releases of other companies which is kind of just like marketing you know they're aggregating the marketing content that LSPs provide, which is, by the way, the same thing that is happening on the localization subreddit. 
it's just like people like linking their press releases and white papers and stuff like that and there's no real discussion happening so i think that like the the real discussion is probably happening like in some groups and i need to explore those in the next episode and see what's going on in the social media world of localization so thank you for listening this was my first very first podcast and i really enjoyed this even though i was a little bit pissed and disappointed that i had to do it again because the because my software my dear premiere uh turned me down and fucked me over so now i'm recording in audacity and we'll see how it goes so okay i'm finished i'm finished i'm finished i'm finished now this was episode one of my podcast that i still need to um think of a a name for it i think i'll just call it the localization podcast because that will be easily searchable yes nice okay let's dominate that keyword ha 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 all right all right thank you bye see you next time Thank you.